late 1990s, a gang of professional bank robbers raided cities across seven states. Disguises and speed protected their identity from cameras and the police. They stole hundreds of thousands of dollars, always leaving a bomb to terrorize their victims. With no limits and little evidence, the FBI had to find the bandits before someone got killed. Across the Midwest, a band of armed robbers struck banks at the rate of nearly one per month. They attacked with lightning precision and lethal force. They were in and out in five minutes. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The stakes were raised when the FBI discovered the robbers had an agenda beyond personal wealth. To stop these violent extremists, the FBI need to capture their terrorist leaders. In 1994, the citizens of Ames, Iowa, enjoyed the peaceful life provided by a small college town. Many newcomers had moved to Ames because of the area's low crime rate. On January 25th at 10.30 in the morning, two men entered a bank in town. All right, this is a robbery! Everybody down on the floor! Down, down! Down on the ground! Down, get on the floor! They wore ski masks and held semi-automatic pistols. They ordered everyone to the floor. The teller managed to set off a silent alarm without being seen. The FBI office in nearby Des Moines was alerted to the robbery in progress. The agency had primary investigative jurisdiction in crimes involving federally insured money. Agents immediately responded, but they were 30 miles away from the bank. Bandits quickly emptied the cash drawers. Don't look at me, face the ground. One of them pulled out what appeared to be a bomb. He warned that no one should move for five minutes or it would explode. The employees and customers evacuated as soon as they could. The local police cordoned off the bank as explosive experts worked inside. The bomb proved to be a diversion. Two road flares bound with duct tape. The employees described how one of the gunmen leaped over the counter to grab the money. They grabbed thousands in cash and were in and out of the bank in less than five minutes. Agents interviewed the witnesses. So did you guys want to add anything else? They said the gunmen sometimes used it. Spanish when talking to each other. The security camera provided photographs of the robbery. Ski masks effectively hid the faces of the assailants. But investigators had images of their disguises and their weapons. Nine millimeter semi-automatics. Because the perpetrators wore gloves, they did not leave any fingerprints. Detectives used electrostatic tape to recover a footprint from the counter. The precautions taken by the bandits had effectively obscured their identities. Special Agent Ken Moore of the Des Moines, Iowa FBI field office was immediately concerned that they were dealing with dangerous professionals. Now, most bank robbers try to enter banks as quietly as possible, uh, go up to one teller counter, 
uh, and proceed to rob the bank and then leave as quietly as they can. Uh, these individuals came in very violently, fast. Agent Moore wanted to apprehend the suspects as quickly as he could. But the FBI had nothing of value to lead to their identity. Several weeks later, a communique came into the Des Moines office. It alerted area FBI of a February 15th bank robbery in Davenport, Iowa. Agents contacted the Davenport office to see if the incident might be related. The agent described two gunmen wearing ski masks and black overcoats that had invaded a Davenport bank. The thieves used the same Spanish phrases as the Des Moines bandits. They also hopped over the counter to empty the cash drawers. There was one significant difference. This time, the bandits left a real explosive, a pipe bomb instead of a fake. Fortunately, the detonator was missing. Disarming it had slowed down the investigation. What that device does is it uh, uh, requires more manpower that could be out conducting an active investigation. Instead, they're at the bank uh, making sure things are safe. Uh, Investigators believed that the similarities between the incidents were more than coincidental. After the Davenport bank robbery, we realized that the same individuals were responsible for both bank robberies, and this was our first connection to uh, possible serial, serial bank robbers. Okay, see you later, have a good night. In the next four months, Cincinnati, Green Bay, and Kansas City suffered similar crimes. There appeared to be a pattern of their robberies. Uh, there appeared to be two regions where they were robbing banks, the, the Midwest region as well as the Ohio region. We were trying to logically connect those two regions and why banks were being robbed that way. The robberies occurred between 10 and 11 in the morning when banks were less populated. Each time, the bandits were out in less than five minutes, always leaving an inert bomb as they fled. The wide geographic spread of targets made their next moves impossible to predict. I'll get back with you. The FBI needed to find some evidence that would lead to the suspects. The thing got suspects in On June 8, 1994, the bandits hit a bank in Springdale, Ohio. They drove away with over eleven thousand dollars. A bystander saw them use a brown Chevrolet as their getaway car. On June 17th, a security guard became suspicious of a car on his employer's lot. It had been sitting for a week without anyone claiming it. He saw a police scanner. He also spotted a pager next to a stained $20 bill. A Springdale officer came out to check the car. He began a search to ascertain the vehicle's ownership. He made an effort to force open the glove compartment. A grenade tumbled out. The hand grenade turned out to be another inert explosive, but its presence linked the car to the bank robbery. Agents used the car's serial numbers to track down the dealership where it had been sold. They talked to the salesman who had handled the deal. The sale had been made less than two weeks earlier, but he couldn't give a description of the buyer. The dead ends left investigators feeling the pressure. Uh, we were becoming frustrated uh, because the uh, escalation of violence seemed to have been increasing. Uh, they were more brazen, were brandishing firearms, scaring uh, bank employees, they were scaring customers. Uh, leaving behind uh, booby traps. So we were very frustrated uh, and we were concerned. On December 27th, the bandits finished 1994 with their 12th robbery in as many months. They hit a bank outside St. Louis. This time, there were four gunmen. 
now we were concerned over uh, possible takeovers of banks, um, uh, possible entry into the bank vault. Uh, with four people, there's a lot more they can do. Bystanders at the St. Louis robbery saw the bandits put on their ski masks before entering the building. A teller got a glimpse of one of them inside the bank. These witnesses helped FBI artists make composite sketches of the suspects. The FBI distributed the drawings to other agencies in the media. They hoped it might bring someone forward who might know something more. The television and news reports generated hundreds of calls into the FBI offices. Agents followed up on all credible tips, but none provided any lead value. The assailants communicated with the media as well. They sent letters and cartoons to newspapers. The correspondents ridiculed federal agents and their attempts to catch them. In one letter, the gang dubbed themselves the Midwestern Bank Bandits. The bandits sent another message to authorities in one of their getaway cars. An investigator searched a vehicle used in a robbery near St. Louis. On the front seat, the gang had left a newspaper clipping about Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber. In less than two years, the bandits had hit at least 15 banks across the Midwest. By the end of August 1995, agents from seven states and FBI headquarters gathered in Louisville, Kentucky. All the officers were now working together to identify and apprehend the suspects. All information and leads were to be channeled through a single office, then distributed to the others. Right, we'll work on that. See if we can't raise the serial number or something off it. Special Agent Moore in Des Moines served as the point man. The meeting also resulted in all uh, case agents going back to their office, reviewing all files to see if there's anything they may have missed or anything of, of lead value that might assist us in identifying the suspects. Supervisory Special Agent David Welker found a phone tip that came into his Cincinnati office after a June 1994 robbery. The informant had named two men as the leaders of the Midwestern bank bandits, Peter Langan and Richard Guthrie. Well, you determined at the time that uh, they had criminal backgrounds, that uh, uh, as we set out our leads, that they had been arrested in Georgia uh, for the robbery of a pizza hut. And then uh, we found also at the time that the US Secret Service had looked at Langan as a result of uh, threats made to the president. At the arrest, police seized semi-automatic guns and grenades, weapons similar to those used by the bank bandits. The suspect served a brief prison sentence before being released. Agent Welker was able to pull their mug shots. He compared the photographs with the artist's sketches made after the St. Louis robberies. And they were so close then that it was it was phenomenal. It, it appeared that the, the composite artist used these photographs to draw the composite drawings. That's how close they were. Agents now had names for the gunmen. In pursuing them, the FBI was about to uncover a far more deadly plot than bank robbery. In 1995, the FBI hunted the Midwestern bank bandits. The day before Thanksgiving, the four gunmen struck another bank in St. Louis, their 21st robbery. Their disguise included ATF hats, the same caps worn by federal agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They also left their signature pipe bomb. None of these explosive devices had gone off. 
they had either been inert or lacking detonators. By now, agents knew how to defuse the bombs themselves. They weren't going to let the ruse slow the investigation down anymore. Supervisory Special Agent David Welker of the Cincinnati office had names for two of the bandits. But Peter Langan and Richard Guthrie were living underground, surfacing only when they struck another bank. Clearly, we've identified the right people. We're trying to develop as much information about these people and their contacts as possible. But the best part about it is we have leads to follow. In the intervening months, the informant who had provided the names had moved from Ohio. First set of robberies to uh, tear gas canister. Special Agent Ed Woods of the Cincinnati FBI field office tracked the informant to Georgia, where he lived with his new wife and child. This fellow had been an associate of, of Langan and Guthrie in the past, had, had removed himself from that lifestyle and was starting a new life for himself. And I think he was, he was ready to put all that behind him. So when I interviewed him, he cooperated fully. I need to ask you a few questions. The informant had met Langan in 1991 at a white supremacist rally. The Bible says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and a black neighbor. Right yeah. They shared sacrifice similar beliefs about race and government. A year later, Langan proclaimed his intention to form the Aryan Republican Army. It was going to start a revolution against Washington and its federal agencies like the FBI and ATF. Langan had been inspired by the Order, an established terrorist group. The Order had financed their racist agenda by robbing $4 million from banks and armored cars. Hey, how's it going? That evening, Langan introduced Guthrie as his compatriot. Two months before the first bank robbery, they asked the informant to become a member of the Aryan Army. Well, I've got some stuff here. He declined to join the new gang. But he did agree to pitch in. What we got from this cooperating witness was the scope of, of their activities. The, the surgical planning for the, their bank robbery activities, the fact that now we learn for the first time that their activities aren't just bank robbery and, 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 and criminal matters, it relates to white supremacy. The informant helped Langan case the bank in Springdale, Ohio. But before that June 1994 robbery, the informant had a change of heart and cut himself off from the bandits. He had participated enough to be charged as an accomplice. The FBI promised not to prosecute him if he assisted. They were ready to make a deal to capture Langan and Guthrie. Once we determined that they had broken off uh, other white supremacist organizations to form their own, it certainly ratcheted the, uh, the investigation up just another notch. Agent Welker suspected it was only a matter of time before the Midwestern bank bandits turned their racial prejudice into violence. The gang was back in Cincinnati hitting another bank in December 1995. During their escape, one of the bandits bumped into a teenager. The gunman demanded her purse. She refused to comply. Only the sound of approaching sirens prevented the young woman from being seriously hurt. Betting that the bandits were still in the area, Agent Welker brought the informant to Cincinnati. You know the fellows that are involved. Upon arriving, the informant agreed to re-enter the white supremacist movement. Make sure that he has your pager. Agents instructed okay. him to page the FBI when he and made contact with I the suspects. Contact so, but investigators mean. became frustrated when more than a week passed without any results. 
since he's been here for a week and a half and has provided no information at all and has arranged no meeting, has virtually done nothing, I was more than skeptical as to the, what this cooperating witness could do for us. And I was prepared to send him home because of uh, my disbelief at the time. At 2.30 in the morning of January 17, 1996, the informant paged the FBI. The call roused investigators from sleep to a secret meeting. The informant claimed to have found Guthrie. He was finishing dinner with a friend when Guthrie unexpectedly showed up. The informant invented a reason for being in Cincinnati and engaged the suspect in small talk. Get a minute, talk to you outside. Sure, come on. Hey, you got a minute. Guthrie invited him out to his van to continue the conversation in private. While they sat in the parking lot, the suspect asked his old friend to reconsider joining the gang. <laughs> Guthrie showed off an assault rifle and a bag of armor-piercing bullets. The informant provided a partial license plate number and description of Guthrie's van. Agents still doubted his credibility. So I had Agent Woods arrange to have the cooperating witness in the FBI office at 4 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. I didn't want him to know why he was there. I just wanted him to be there. And then I arranged for my division's polygraph examiner to be there, and I wanted the polygraph of him. I wanted to make sure that what he was telling us was true. The informant agreed to take a lie detector test. I think he's lying. The examiner determined that the young man had been deceptive in his answers during the test. I'm yeah. telling the truth. Listen. The piece I, of paper there, it is. this polygraph doesn't lie. Listen, he insisted he was telling the truth. Let me make a quick phone call. Please, let me make one phone call. One second. I can prove it. Can I can give you one, one more chance. Call. Yes, one come on. Call. Make it a good one. To prove it, he placed a call to the friend with whom he had had dinner. Hey, what's going on, man? Good, man. Yeah. The speakerphone allowed the agents to hear everything. Yeah, hey, what happened with you and Guthrie, man? He took you out in the van. Yeah, Guthrie wants you in, man. Yeah. Without prompting, the yeah, friend immediately asked together. about his time with Guthrie. So now we had to make a decision. And the decision is, do we believe the polygraph or do we believe the phone call? I think at the time, I think the decision we made was the right one. That is, we have to believe the phone call. It was an unprovoked response by the friend. The informant arranged to meet Guthrie on Monday at their mutual friend's apartment. FBI agents assembled an arrest team. They staked out the location, ready to capture the suspect when he arrived. The informant waited inside the apartment. The friend did not know why the meeting had been arranged. Guthrie had promised to come sometime between 4 and 5 p.m. 5 o'clock came and went without the white supremacist arriving. The informant knew that more than his credibility was at stake. So was his cooperation agreement. If the FBI believed he had deceived them, they would turn him over to prosecutors for bank robbery. At 5.20, there was still no sign of Guthrie. It looked like the suspect would not show up. Outside, the arrest team grew impatient. It was Guthrie on the phone. He said they could meet at a nearby pizza restaurant in 30 minutes. All right, 30 minutes. Campbell, down? Yeah, yeah. 
Um, the informant needed to get word to the arrest team. He told his buddy he was going out for cigarettes. The informant told the agents the about the call. Yeah. This man. The meeting's been changed a little bit. We're meeting just a little bit up the road. Everything's still fine, though, okay? I think he told him to. I hope he is. Otherwise, he's going to jail. Okay, guys. They alerted the SWAT location. team to the new location. Several cars set out for the pizza parlor. The agents could not help but wonder if this was the location or just another diversion. Along the way, traffic separated the arrest team. One agent was passing a convenience store parking lot when he spotted Guthrie. He turned around and radioed to the others that the suspect had been sighted. Guthrie got into his van and started driving. The agent stayed on the van's tail, hoping the rest of the team would catch up. He was alone, following a suspect considered highly dangerous. But he was determined not to let Richard Guthrie get away. In January 1996, the FBI pursued Richard Guthrie. The suspect was wanted for 22 bank robberies, an agent separated from the arrest team had spotted the suspect at a Cincinnati parking lot and began tailing his van. He reported by radio his progress to the others. You got him in a cul de sac. Where are you? Guthrie noticed that he was being followed. An informant had reported that he was armed with automatic weapons and armor piercing bullets. The suspect tried to lose his tail. The arrest team caught up with a lone agent and joined the chase. Guthrie couldn't shake him. He unwittingly turned into a cul-de-sac. Trapped, he abandoned his van. Agent Ed Wood sprinted right behind him. He caught up to the gunman. It was almost as if it was in slow motion where I, like you could almost read his mind, what he's thinking. He's thinking, I believe, is this it? Is this the last standoff of this white supremacist? And quite frankly, what I expected him to do was to turn and start firing. Guthrie came to a riverbank. He had no escape. Agents boxed him in. I've been in law enforcement for uh, over 20 years, and I've never seen a look on a face like Guthrie's at the time. And Guthrie, as he was looking at us, he was deciding whether he wanted to die right then. He was deciding whether he wanted to pull a gun and take on everybody who was standing there. The suspect chose to live. He submitted to arrest. Catching him, it was, it was a huge relief, and catching him to where there was no violence attached to the arrest, was even a greater relief. Once in custody, Guthrie began talking. He told investigators how he stayed in touch with the other primary suspect, Peter Langan. The friends used coded voicemails to contact one another. He handed over his pager and PIN number. Now, how about this one right here? He claimed his next meeting with Langan was to be in Indianapolis. 
Guthrie's lawyer made an agreement with the FBI. For later consideration in sentencing, they could take the suspect with them to use as bait. Under the arrangement, the accompanying agents weren't allowed to question Guthrie about his crimes. Agent Wilker sought another way to ply information from the bandit's leader. I assigned two agents to guard him. One agent is a former Harrier pilot in the Marine Corps, and the other is our principal firearms instructor. And of course, over a two-day period, there was a lot of discussion going on. I was well aware that Guthrie had, a, had an interest in flying, and he had a keen interest in weapons. During the trip, the agents engaged Guthrie in long conversations about common interests. The congenial strategy worked. The assailant warmed up to his accompanying agents and began volunteering information on the robberies. Guthrie admitted that he had lied to investigators. His rendezvous was really supposed to take place in Columbus, Ohio, not Indianapolis, where the investigators had taken him. 2709 control. He gave them the address of a safe house. He told them Langan was heavily armed. He would not come out without a fight. An FBI arrest team assembled the next morning in Columbus. Langan's van was parked next to the duplex Guthrie had described. The plan was to wait until the suspect exited his home and got into his van. Then as he pulled out, FBI cars would box him in. This would contain him and prevent a vehicular pursuit. All escape avenues were blocked off. At 9.30 a.m., Langan left the duplex carrying a canvas bag. Agents suspected this held an assault weapon. He got into his van, but failed to start the engine. The arrest team waited for the word. Once he was observed getting into the van, the, the adrenaline for everyone there was flowing. Everyone knew something was going to happen. The suspect sat motionless. Agents didn't know if he was planning something. He seemed as if he anticipated the arrest. Finally, the signal went right, out to move moving. in. Let's take him, let's take him. In what agents thought was a suicide move, Langan had decided to put up a fight. On January 18, 1996, the suspected leader of 22 bank robberies decided to shoot it out with an FBI SWAT team. Supervisory Special Agent David Welker of the Cincinnati office led the arrest team. Someone who's gonna pull a gun on 20 or more FBI agents is one nasty dude. He's one nasty criminal. Peter Langan was one gun against many. SWAT team bullets pummeled the van. It was over within moments, but not before 50 rounds had been fired. Langan survived and surrendered. Despite the hail of bullets, he suffered only minor injuries to the face and back. After two years of pursuit, the leaders of the Midwestern bank bandits were now in custody. Two other accomplices remained at large. The van was filled with semi-automatic guns, ammunition, and grenades. Inside the canvas bag, Agents found a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. It was the same make of weapon that the bank bandits used. 
Evidence inside the duplex confirmed the bandits were more than a gang of thieves. The house contained an armory big enough to equip a small cadre of terrorists. Agents found ski masks, FBI hats, police uniforms, and false IDs from nearly every state of the Union. Books and literature detailed the gang's creed of militant hate. Commander Pedro. Investigators discovered a tape among the propaganda. It targeted young white males for recruitment into the Aryan Republican Army. Today, we are preparing to take over the USA. Tomorrow, the world. Please have a seat. A Columbus bank teller had briefly glimpsed the face of one of the bandits 17 months earlier. See anybody that you recognize? Detectives gave her a photo lineup, hoping she could remember enough to make an ID. Despite the intervening months, she picked out Langan from the array of similar-looking men. While Langan refused to cooperate, Guthrie agreed to tell all he knew. Agents debriefed him 10 hours a day for 10 straight days. How many accomplices did you have? He could recall all the places, times, and dates. It took 99 pages to detail the 22 robberies. But when it came to his at-large accomplices, Guthrie only knew their first names. The bank bandits had been assembled like an underground terrorist cell. Personal information on others was kept to a minimum to prevent capture. Guthrie could only offer that the man he knew only as Scott was involved in music. The man he knew as Kevin was the nephew of a police officer. Hi, this officer. is uh, Supervisor Special Agent. Both lived in the Philadelphia area. Yeah. Uh, the scant information was forwarded to Pennsylvania. Special Agent Joe Hendrickson of the Philadelphia FBI field office was initially overwhelmed by the request. There was no hope of finding these people with that information. I sat back and had a cup of coffee. And then I said, well, I'll go contact the Philadelphia Police Department. And there's a possibility that maybe their personnel records indicate nephews. But I was in much doubt that that type of record existed because I know that in my outfit, uh, I did not list nieces and nephews in my personnel file. Philadelphia had 7,000 police officers, any one of which could be Kevin's uncle. The search began at the intelligence division of the police department. An officer knew immediately who the FBI was looking for. The division had been keeping tabs on white supremacists in the area. Intelligence officers had kept them under surveillance for over a year. Officers often spotted them meeting on a farm belonging to Mark Thomas. Over the years, the Philadelphia Police Department had been taking down tags at various rallies and so forth. And at some point in time, they took down a tag, ran the tag, and it came out to Kevin McCarthy. And then they said, you know, we've got a, a lieutenant here that has that name. They contacted him, and lo and behold, they found out that Kevin McCarthy was attending uh, Aryan Nation rallies. Hendrickson put a surveillance squad on Kevin McCarthy. They observed him repeatedly visiting a recording studio in Philadelphia. Agents noted the license numbers of the cars outside the business. They ran the plates for all the people going in and out. One of the vehicles belonged to a man named Scott Steadiford. He managed the studio and also played drums in McCarthy's band. From his amateur photo, Guthrie confirmed that this was the Scott he had worked with. Using that same photo, a witness also recognized Steadiford as the getaway driver in the Des Moines robbery. An arrest warrant was sent to Philadelphia.
the studio presented too many risks for officers to invade en force. Agents could not be sure who was inside and what weapons might be hidden. They didn't want another shootout. We're writing it for my mom, okay. actually, and um, these are the lyrics I came up with. And Two undercover agents posed as father and daughter. Yeah, yeah, Dad, and that works for that. The female agent asked Stediford about the cost of studio time. She claimed she wanted to record a song for her mother. Can you grab your guitar? As Stediford considered a quote, the undercover agents confirmed that he was alone and unarmed. The agents drew on him. They placed him under arrest. The FBI did not have an arrest warrant for Kevin McCarthy. They feared that he would run once he heard about Stediford's capture. What we ended up doing was we brought his uncle, the Philadelphia police officer, with us. We felt that with his blood relative, the law enforcement presence, and the total set of circumstances, that we hoped that he would somehow uh, be convinced that the thing to do would be to cooperate. The uncle entered the basement bedroom. He disarmed his sleeping nephew. The agent woke the young man. Kevin? Special agent FBI. Son. He began explaining that it was in McCarthy's best interest to cooperate with the FBI. Yes, We kind of know what went on today. Only suspicion tied the young man to the crimes. The agent needed a confession. He showed McCarthy the 99-page admission made by Guthrie. And when he saw this report describing every bank robbery, what they did, where they went, uh, he realized that uh, we had all the information. He just didn't realize that we had no evidence. The young man was overwhelmed. He voluntarily turned over the weapon and clothing he used in the robberies. When he began to confess, his uncle stopped him and advised him to get a lawyer. With all the suspects now in custody, agents considered their investigation wrapped up. On July 3rd, 1996, Richard Guthrie pleaded guilty to 19 bank robberies. He agreed to testify against his accomplices. With his cooperation, prosecutors considered their case airtight. Nine days later, the cooperating witness hanged himself in a jail cell. The suicide devastated the government's case. Now, that created a major problem for the prosecution because since Guthrie could no longer be cross-examined, his information couldn't be used directly against Langer. If the other bank bandits were going to be convicted, the FBI had to find someone else who could corroborate Guthrie's confession. In 1996, the legal case against the Midwestern bank bandits was on the verge of collapse. The chief cooperating witness had killed himself. Without his testimony, the evidence against his captured co-defendants was slim. Special Agent Joe Hendrickson spearheaded the investigation in Philadelphia. These bank robbers were very, very good, and the evidence that they left behind at every robbery was zero. They were fully masked, fully gloved. They, their weapons were untraceable. Hendrickson helped convince Kevin McCarthy to plead guilty and turn state's witness. But prosecutors needed more than one cooperating felon to convict the others. Investigators focused on the man who had steered suspects into the Aryan Republican Army. Mark Thomas had turned Scott Stediford and Kevin McCarthy into outlaws. Thomas edited a newsletter and web page for white supremacists. His literature and videos had swayed many young men into racist and anti-government organizations. And we felt that even though he was not personally involved, in these crimes, 
that he had caused these crimes to come about and therefore he was responsible and and based on conspiracy uh, laws we felt that it was quite possible to go after him for conspiring to commit bank robbery. The FBI made weekly contact with Thomas at his Pennsylvania farm. I want to ask you some questions. They wanted to know about his activities, but more importantly, they wanted to keep pressure on him. Years, you know, I've had about enough of you guys coming over here and messing with me. They made it clear that they suspected him and weren't going away. Cool. Kevin McCarthy told investigators that he and Scott Steddeford had stayed at Thomas's home. He acted like a father figure to them and warned them of the coming race war. He brought the young men to live in Elohim City, a white separatist compound in Oklahoma. During the summer of 1994, Thomas invited them to join the Aryan Republican Army. In mid-October, Scott Steder had agreed. He participated in his first bank robbery two weeks later. On November 13th, Thomas drove Kevin McCarthy to Arkansas for an introduction to Langdon and Guthrie. The teenager heard them boast of successfully robbing banks throughout the Midwest. The 17-year-old joined up. Agents also learned from McCarthy that Thomas took $100 in stolen money for the start of an Aryan war chest. Over the months of contact, agents caught Thomas in several lies about his activities. This is my farm, and I don't need to farm, you know? They took what they had to U.S. prosecutors. I'm doing what he said. The United States Attorney's Office decided that uh, based on the cooperating witnesses' testimony, we were going to arrest him. Even though it was a very slim case, it was a close cause, the United States Attorney's Office would say, but we're going to put out an arrest warrant for him. Thomas heard that the FBI was going to pick him up on a charge of conspiracy. He agreed to surrender after calling the media to witness the event. He told the press their presence prevented his assassination. Thomas pleaded not guilty at his arraignment hearing on February 4, 1997. He asked to meet with the FBI the next day. That's where Mark Thomas caved. He signed a seven-page plea agreement that corroborated Kevin McCarthy's confession. The government's case was now solid. This was the biggest surprise of anyone's involved in the case. The idea that the head of the movement, after one day in prison, would decide to completely cooperate was just unfathomable. But apparently our pressure over the, the six months that it, of continually talking to him, and then the one night in prison was uh, enough for him to decide that he had been completely wrong in his ideals and that he wanted to, uh, as he said, get right with God. They Mark Thomas they was sentenced to nine and a half years in prison. Down. Down to Peter Langan was convicted on bank robbery and gun charges. He received life without parole. Kevin McCarthy got five years. His testimony helped convict Scott Steddeford on two counts of armed bank robbery. The court sentenced Steddeford to 29 and a half years. In America, extremist groups enjoy the freedom to maintain their beliefs. They are constitutionally protected until they cross the legal line. If they engage in outlaw activities, they will find the FBI on a mission to stop them. Two thieves develop a terrifying pattern, combining bank robberies with home invasions and taking families of bank executives hostage. 
For years, federal agents track them, always one step behind. Even when they're caught, the robbers do not quit. An ingenious escape sends the fugitives on another crime spree, with the FBI once again on their trail. Too often, convicted felons learn new techniques and find new partners in prison. In 1982, a group of former inmates began a spree of kidnapping and robbery. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. For years, the suspects used false names and a network of criminal contacts to elude capture. To find them, the FBI had to pierce their tight-knit circle and find new partners of their own. On December 28, 1982, Oklahoma City Bank Vice President Steve Thompson and his wife Ellen arrived home from a holiday party. Unexpectedly, a car pulled in behind them. When they got out of the car and started entering our garage, they hollered, Mr. Thompson, we're federal agents. They were on top of us, you know, with just in a few seconds. Ellen Thompson thought perhaps the men had the wrong house. I couldn't think of any reason federal agents would be coming to our house, and I've heard of mistakes before, so uh, I looked at him and said, there must be some mistake here. Can I see your identification? And he pulls out a gun. The one with the obvious wig seemed to be the enforcer. The other one was in charge. There was obviously one other male involved because somebody drove him to our house, and that car left and we never saw that car again. The two gunmen forced the couple inside. The leader began interrogating Thompson about the bank where he worked. No. He cooperated so the incident could end without anyone getting hurt. Mm -hmm. No, Thompson answered complex. some questions about the bank's complex security system, the doors, but he knew the safety of his employees came first. And you I didn't know. give him names of actual people that had combinations and stuff. I said, we'll just have to wait and see who gets there and who has the combinations and stuff, because I didn't, you know, I didn't want to put any individuals in jeopardy. I see. A man called to speak with a gunman. Yeah. Uh-huh. It sounded like they were okay. finalizing plans for a robbery the next day. Well, call me back at 6.30. The leader warned Thompson to follow his orders exactly. Okay. He was trying to make a point with me, and, and, and he said, uh, if anybody sets off the alarms tomorrow, if anything goes wrong and the police come, he said, I'm going to kill the police. Tell me. He made the comment at that point. He said, he said, I'm not going back to the penitentiary. The gunman held the couple hostage overnight. An hour before dawn, they forced the Thompsons to drive them to the bank. Woman? At 9 a.m., they waited for employees to arrive. She's wearing a black dress, floral print. They had someone stationed outside as a lookout. She's coming in the front door. During the robbery, one person was in contact with somebody by phone the whole time. And they were able to give him detail as far as how many people were coming to the front door. The gunman knew only certain employees had access to the multi-layered security system. We had our visitors this morning, but if everybody cooperates, we'll be okay. Ma'am, I need to know, do you have the combination to the safe? No. I need no. you to come with me. Those without codes or combinations were shoved into a bathroom holding area. What's going on? Blonde, 
tall. Act natural, everything will be fine. It always takes you know, more than one person to access anything. You have different layers of security within the vault and the cash vaults themselves within the vaults. Sir, I need to know, do you have the combination to the safe? It's okay. Yes, I do. I need you to come with me. Anyone with a code was put to work. So that's what he was trying to determine was who was going to be able to access that cash. Other employees had gotten them close. One final combination stood between the robbers and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Get it open. Don't play here. Don't be stupid. The robber with the wig was the more threatening one. Do what you're told, no one gets hurt. Good, now get in there and fill them up. Within 30 minutes, the gunman had hundreds of thousands of dollars in hand. Did you get it? Got it. Come on. I need your keys. They herded Mr. Thompson and the manager in with the other hostages. He put me in one of the restrooms, and he told me and the people at our restroom that said, we're going to be here five more minutes. Nobody stick their head out. And they left, and I was pretty sure that, you know, from hearing the conversations out there, that they were going to leave right away. No, wait. So I probably waited, uh, you know, probably a minute and a half before I came out. Here, the robbers had gone. Thompson directed the manager to contact authorities. Go ahead and call the police. Yes, uh, Quill Creek Bank's just been robbed. Uh, we need the police here right away. The call went out to nearby Oklahoma City patrol units. Following standard procedure, Oklahoma City police also contacted the FBI. Special Agent Mike Cycle took the call. I shouted to other agents uh, on the squad that uh, we had a bank robbery. I gave them the location and uh, gave them a, a little bit of information about what was going on, the fact that the robbers were gone, and uh, we had a bunch of agents in head for the bank. The patrol units arrived first. They approached quietly and cleared the bank, making sure no gunmen were still inside. FBI agents arrived minutes later. The Hobbs Act, enacted in 1946 to protect federally insured depositors, makes bank robberies the jurisdiction of the FBI. It meant a nationwide police force would investigate the crime and go after the robbers. The Thompsons described the ordeal that began in their home the night before. So no one was hurt. Didn't have anybody hurt. It had been a sophisticated, well-planned crime, with no evidence left behind. These robbers must have struck before. But no similar robberies had occurred in the area in the past. Agents searched the FBI's database to see if any had been committed elsewhere. They found a national file of robbery cases that included invasions of bank employees' homes. So I pulled that file out and found that there were several offices that had robberies where the pattern was very similar. So I started communicating with those offices. He hoped to find an agent who had experience with whoever robbed the Oklahoma City Bank and located Special Agent Steve Chenoweth at the Phoenix FBI. 
Hey, listen. Cycle described the Oklahoma City home invasion style bank robbery, the robbers' disguises and their mannerisms. How many guys? Chenoweth immediately named two bank robbers he knew, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty, as having operated that way. All those things are, are typical of what they had done in the past. And so a lot of that, uh, once I learned the actual details of what had occurred in Oklahoma City, just uh, pointed a finger right at those two. Witness descriptions from Oklahoma City match the felons. Because of his knowledge of the pair, Chenoweth became the lead case agent. He knew that Connor and Doherty had met in federal prison. Terry Connor was the leader, in for three Arizona bank robberies. Each time, he and his partner had held bank employees hostage overnight. Joe Doherty was just a thug from uh, Philadelphia and uh, was a stick-up uh, guy, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, you know, gun in the right hand, maybe a note in the other hand, and, you know, give me what you got across the counter. Um, not a very sophisticated M.O. at all, and uh, certainly um, didn't have the smarts that Terry Connor had. Connor was a smooth talker, recruiting accomplices with ease. Terry was, uh, you know, primarily a West Coast guy, and uh, Terry, uh, being from the West Coast and being uh, from California, uh, we did certainly concentrate our efforts out there in California looking for him. Agents contacted the Monterey, California FBI resident agency. They told Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer what they knew about Terry Connor. Oklahoma City went on to tell us that uh, the suspicion was that he had a girlfriend that lived in Pacific Grove, California, and they wondered if he might not be heading that direction and asked us to do some work to see if we could work that angle. They located Connor's girlfriend's home. Routine surveillance revealed a possible link to Terry Connor, who was last believed to be in Oklahoma City. While doing a spot check on this residence, lo and behold, there was a vehicle parked out front with Oklahoma license plates on it. So I notified the Oklahoma City office, and uh, they didn't actually have a record of that vehicle that they could positively tie into Terry Connor at the time, but they thought it might have been one that he purchased under an alias. I'll tell you what, you ever seen the... While the girlfriend was away from the house, agents spoke with her gardener. Identifying themselves, they told him they were conducting a federal investigation. He needed to be truthful and discreet. They asked if he had recently seen any men at the residence. He hadn't but recalled overhearing the girlfriend talking about meeting Connor the following week. The information I got was specific enough that we knew that on a given day, Terry Connor was going to meet somewhere with his girlfriend, and so I felt at that point in time that we were very close to Terry Connor. Agents followed Connor's girlfriend for days, learning that she drove several different cars they placed tracking devices on each of them. With receivers in FBI cars and airplanes, they tracked her whenever she drove. But on the day she was to meet Connor, the signal faded. Once we lost the vehicle, uh, we were uh, spreading our vehicles out in all sorts of directions trying to locate the signal. And we had an airplane assisting us that day, and the airplane uh, uh, gave us the signal out on the highway, and uh, we picked her up again. Agents traveled toward the location of the recaptured signal. When they spotted the car, it was parked in front of a restaurant. There was no sign of the girlfriend or Terry Connor or anybody else that was associated with the car, so we uh, made a plan right then to establish full-time coverage on the car until something happened. Roger, stand down. All right, guys, we're still in stand down mode, stand down. A SWAT team waited, watching for any sign of the suspect. Uh, 
an FBI agent made sure that if the couple returned for the car, they couldn't drive it away. We let the air out of her tires so they wouldn't sneak in and sneak out real fast and waited. Most stakeouts mean long hours with no payoff. But the agents had to stick with it and hope that suspected bank robber Terry Connor would surface. After a hostage taking and bank robbery in Oklahoma City, the FBI developed two suspects, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty. Two months later, and 1,500 miles away in Atascadero, California, agents staked out a restaurant where Connor's girlfriend had left a car. They believed Connor was in the area planning to meet her. The long hours of the stakeout paid off for FBI Special Agent Harlan Freimeyer. We just happened to see Terry Connor drive into the parking lot with his girlfriend, and uh, it doesn't usually work this way, but the photographs we had of Terry Connor were of such quality that it was easy to make instant recognition, so we knew that we were about to uh, accomplish our mission. The suspect was known to carry weapons, so a tactical arrest team took the lead. Hey, hey. FBI, FBI. They struck fast, giving Terry Connor no opportunity to flee. The girlfriend was questioned and released after investigators determined she was not involved in Connor's crimes. Give me left hand. Agents then discovered an unexpected benefit to deflating the tire of the girlfriend's car. By the time we got to the point where we were making our arrest, he had already popped the trunk on his car. And of course, without a search warrant, we couldn't have gotten in there if he hadn't popped it for us. And so once the arrest was made, there we had in plain view the contents of his trunk, and that was useful to us because there was a briefcase that we opened and found a substantial amount of money. Nearly $40,000 in cash bore serial numbers matching some of the money stolen during the Oklahoma City robbery. Agents also found a large diamond and a jeweler's receipt for six more. Authorities took Connor to the Monterey FBI office, where they charged him with the Oklahoma City robbery. In handing over his personal effects during the intake process, something of interest emerged. A sales receipt from a Reno, Nevada car dealership. The buyer was listed as Russell Anderson, perhaps an unknown alias of Connor or Doherty. He had given an address in Santa Maria, California. My instinctive belief was that that address might well be the address of his partner, Doherty. So we put out the word as fast as we could to our counterparts, Southern California, asked them to get out and check that address. A SWAT team immediately went to the residence and prepared to make entry. They suspected Doherty was inside, perhaps armed. bang grenade was designed to stun anyone in the house. Please, 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 please. By the time they got there, whoever had been occupying that address was uh, gone. I fear that possibly they were alerted by Terry Connor in the, in the bookend process when he was given his uh, phone call.
Word that Connor was arrested, but that Doherty was not, went out to case agent Steve Chenoweth. Even though we're looking for two, we're certainly willing to take one. And uh, the fact that we didn't find Joe there was a little disappointing, but uh, also the fact that we did find Terry Connor meant that we had solved uh, half of that equation and we just had to up the ante to find Joe. Chenoweth knew Joe Doherty would keep robbing banks using the method taught him by Connor. But without Terry Connor controlling him, Doherty was a loose cannon, now more dangerous than ever. Terry was uh, the brains. Uh, Terry was the guy that made most of the decisions. And now you're putting uh, Joe, who is more prone to violence than Terry was, uh, basically in a leadership role. If he should fly off the handle, there might not be anybody there to calm him down. For eight months, there was no sign of Doherty anywhere. Then, in Phoenix, on the night before the busiest shopping day of the year, when banks are stocked up with cash, the vice president of a large area bank returned home with his family from a Thanksgiving dinner with relatives. What happened? It appeared their home had been burglarized. But the intruders hadn't left. Through the night, the two robbers held the banker and his family hostage. We just want to rob the bank. Just calm down. It looked like Joe Doherty was leading a new partner. And now that he was in charge, Do you understand? anything could happen. Settle in and be friends. Thanksgiving, 1983. They're told no one gets hurt. Give me the keys. Two intruders held a Phoenix banker and his family hostage overnight. Go start the car. Hours before dawn, Joe Doherty and his new partner were ready to rob the bank. They would use the banker's car for transportation and his children for collateral. Doherty never put down his weapon. Remember, I've got the gun on your wife. Get in the car. In less than two hours, they would drive to the bank, empty its vault, and escape with $270,000 cash, leaving the family frightened but unharmed. What's the address? The heist was in the home city of the lead case agent okay. on Doherty's trail. OK, put it out to all agents. When Steve Chenoweth learned of the crime, he believed he knew who had done it. Thanks. My first thought right away is um, Joe Doherty, but didn't know the answer to that until I started talking to the victims to get an actual physical description. Wondering if Doherty was taunting him by striking in his own town, Chenoweth headed to the banker's home to learn more details of a fearful night spent held at gunpoint. Most of us don't go through that. And uh, to go through it for an entire evening uh, with your two children uh, is a very scary thing. And so uh, they were glad it was over, and they were certainly glad to see us come. Jack, can you tell me just a little bit more about? The banker described the assailants, saying both wore obvious wigs, and the bigger one was in charge. Once I got the information, um, the physical description of the leader uh, fit that of Joe Doherty uh, right to a T. So I knew that we were dealing with Joe, but here again, uh, we had another individual that he had picked up, and we didn't know who that guy was as his partner. Normally there. The family described how the pair had acted. Doherty and his new partner were more volatile and threatening than he and Connor had been. But as before, they left agents with no leads. One bigger guy that... Six months later, and 900 miles to the northwest in Reno, Nevada, local police called the FBI to another robbed bank. Once again, the heist was preceded by a hostage-taking the night before. 
But this time, the level of violence had increased. Now, there was a bomb. They'd strapped it around the uh, bank officer, indicating that it was explosives. And if he didn't do uh, what he was told to do, that they would detonate that. And that certainly is enough to put the fear of God into you. And, and I would certainly do anything that they asked me to do. I want to stay with him. I'm right outside, Bob. Determining there were no booby traps, a Reno police bomb specialist freed the terrified bank officer and sent him out of the vault to safety. cut off the power supply, though he later determined the device was a fake. The bank officer told the FBI that he and his family had been held hostage at gunpoint overnight by two men wearing wigs and business suits. Uh, recognize the gentleman in this picture right here? That's him. Shown a photo of Joseph Doherty, he said it looked like one of the men. Witnesses had seen a white sedan with Washington state plates speeding away from the bank after the robbery. So agents searched the area. They found the vehicle abandoned less than 200 yards from the Reno FBI office. It seemed Doherty was again boldly challenging the FBI. A check of the plates showed it was registered to a man in Spokane, Washington. That man said he had recently sold the car to someone who fit the description of Doherty and a pregnant woman whom the FBI believed to be Doherty's girlfriend. To help find the couple, the FBI called on the U.S. Marshals, experts in interstate tracking of cars and people. United States Marshal Denny Barrand believed the cars Doherty used would be the key to finding him. As fugitives, Joseph Doherty was very smart. He changed cars like some people change socks. Uh, he would uh, buy cars, sell them, sell them back to the original owners, sell them to a used car lot. Marshalls painstakingly followed a complex trail of cars and aliases and eventually got a break. They discovered a car accident report linking one of Doherty's aliases to an address in Idaho. Hi there. Since the house appeared to be abandoned, the marshals interviewed neighbors. Yeah, this, this is One woman I mean. immediately recognized the robber, though she only knew him by his alias. Yeah. She said he had the peculiar habit of shooting pistols in his backyard. Baby. And about a week ago, though, they packed up and moved away. She told the marshals that he, his girlfriend, and their newborn child had recently moved out. OK, go ahead. Securing a subpoena for moving truck rental records in the area, okay. marshals determined Doherty's girlfriend had rented one under a false name right. and had driven Good. it to Colorado. Now, check on that Good. The rental company right. gave authorities her destination, a house in the mountains outside Denver. FBI agents and U.S. marshals watched from the cover of the woods surrounding the house. Because there was now a baby involved, they had to be especially cautious. At one point, they observed the girlfriend leaving the house with another man. It wasn't Doherty. The marshals could not see if they had the infant with them. Other marshals followed the two into town and watched them enter a store without the baby. I said, go to the car that's parked in the shopping mall parking lot and look inside and see if they left the baby inside the car. It's 
it's a negative on the kid in the car. Uh, we're gonna go check out. And they radioed back to me, no, the baby's not in the car. And they didn't have the baby in arms. That means one thing, the baby's still at the house. Still at the house with Joseph Doherty. After two years of constantly being minutes too late, authorities believed they were finally going to arrest the dangerous robber. But in law enforcement, things rarely happen exactly as planned. Two years after Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty robbed an Oklahoma City bank, Connor had been captured, convicted of armed bank robbery, and sentenced to 25 years. The FBI believed his partner, Joseph Doherty, had continued a spree of hostage taking and bank robbery, but that they finally had him cornered in a Colorado house. Earlier that day, they had arrested the fugitive's girlfriend and a male associate. The girlfriend confirmed that Doherty and their infant child were still inside the house. And that Doherty was armed. A SWAT team fanned out in stations around the house. Copy number two. Number three, are you in position? Same thing, just moving around. Go. Also watching was U.S. Marshal Denny Berend. Joseph Doherty stepped out of the house, positively identified, and with that he took a 357 Magnum and started to fire into the woods. But it didn't look like Doherty was firing at the agents. The SWAT team had to keep cool. I just hunker down. If you're not in danger, don't return fire. Don't return fire unless you're being threatened. The marshals recalled the neighbor in Idaho who had said Doherty often fired random shots in his backyard. They believed he didn't know they were there. Okay, just hold your fire. Hold your fire and let me know if he comes back out again. We're going to try him on the phone. They still needed to resolve the situation peacefully. An FBI negotiator placed a call to the house. Hello. This is the FBI. We have you surrounded. The negotiator he said, I established contact, but the person is hung up. It was answered by a male, but he hung up. Got it. The well-trained snipers had several possible shots at the fugitive but they held off. We had to consider, of course, the safety of the baby. We had to consider the safety of other people that might be in the home that we didn't know about. They've seen him go past the window several times. They see the baby. Has anybody caught sight of the child? Anybody seen the child? Still, they had to be ready if Doherty started firing at them. Again, try to get him on the phone. Stay in and be ready. The negotiator called the house again. You don't want the child to get hurt, come out of the house. He told the fugitive that his girlfriend and accomplice had already been arrested. Come out of the house. And asked Doherty to consider his child's safety and surrender peacefully. He hung up. All right, guys, he hung up. Let's move right, in. Move to the, the front, front now. Through the window, they saw him approaching the door.
he was arrested without a struggle. Once we had the baby out of the house, we had the house secured, then we began to move through it. And we discovered 16 firearms in that house, including a 308 tactical assault rifle, two of those, um, all hidden, all loaded, all charged and ready to go to defend that house. Doherty was charged and held for trial in Oklahoma. Almost a year and a half later, on June 19, 1985, Two U.S. Marshals were transporting Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty to an Oklahoma City courthouse. Oh, my guess, sure. Doherty was facing the first of four trials, this one for the bank robbery and hostage taking in Oklahoma City three years earlier. He had subpoenaed his partner, Terry Connor, as a witness. <laughs> On a rural road, they made their move with smuggled jailhouse contraband a handcuff key and a razor blade. They had never planned on arriving at the courthouse. They took the marshal's guns. Pull over. And ordered them off the road. Yeah. Okay. They marched the lawman into the woods. The felons were desperate for freedom, and it seemed no one could stop them from gaining it. June 19th, 1985. Bank robbers Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty escaped the custody of two U.S. Marshals while in transit to Doherty's trial. The fugitives handcuffed the marshals to a tree and stole their weapons, badges, and car. They were mobile, armed, and for now, no one knew they were back on the run. They had a 15-minute head start before the marshals managed to free themselves and report the escape. At the U.S. courthouse in Oklahoma City, Special Agent Steve Chenoweth was shocked when he heard the news. My initial thought was, uh, this can't happen. When you put so much time and effort into uh, a case like this over a period of years, and to have it just kind of disappear in a flash, in a moment's notice, um, it's a real severe letdown. Bank surveillance videos captured Connor and Doherty's next crimes. Two small-scale bank robberies in St. Louis. Agents believe they needed some quick cash before getting back to their regular routine. Initially, after the escape and after the fact that they had held up both banks there in, um, in St. Louis, and had about $30,000 cash. We knew that they were gonna be coming back out and striking again at a uh, bank, at a bank officer and his family. We knew that there was a potential, a high potential for kidnapping. Uh, we knew that the, uh, the uh, propensity for violence was great. Two months later, police in West Allis, Wisconsin, received a bank robbery call. This is Sherry, help you? You're at what bank? Can you the address, please? A half million dollars was taken, the largest bank heist in the state's history. Station to squad 113, you're responding to a bank robbery, 10707 West National Avenue. It was by now an all too familiar pattern. Two gunmen had held the bank president and his wife hostage, then, again aided by a lookout, robbed the bank.
Fingerprints placed Connor and Doherty at the scene. Local police called the Wisconsin FBI. Special Agent Dan Kraft was assigned the case. Reading witness statements, he saw that the fugitives were bolder than ever, no longer even using disguises. They did nothing to conceal their identity. They didn't do anything to really help by saying their names, but he, uh, Terry Connor did mention to the bank president's wife, he said, uh, the FBI is going to know who we are. Because of the continuing danger Connor and Doherty posed, both were placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Media coverage drew many leads. Use your help on it. One call led agents to a man that. who might have been the robber's lookout outside the Wisconsin the bank. Agents issued an APB for the alleged lookout's car. Days later, a state trooper pulled him over and called the FBI. Um, what got going on here? Once they identified him, they took him in. There was an active open warrant for him f out of uh, St. Louis for violating his federal parole. So we arrested him and I uh, brought him downtown to the FBI office. At first, the man refused to answer questions about Connor and Doherty. So we would talk, and this went on for five days. But it wasn't a sweating. I mean, you see on television where it looks like an interrogation and you're getting in somebody's face. No, it was just two men talking. Finally, Kraft won him over. But he was afraid of facing Connor and Doherty in court. I'd like to cooperate, he says, but you know, I won't testify. So you don't have to testify. We don't need your testimony. You know, we've got these guys locked in. I just need to know how they think. I need to know what they do and how they do it so I can get one step ahead of them. The suspect agreed to talk in the hopes of a reduced sentence. He told Kraft how Connor and Doherty chose the banks they robbed, how they traveled, even how they communicated through hotel front desks. One of them would call up and make a reservation in the name of a former prison warden. And the other one would call up and ask if this person had checked in yet. And uh, the switchboard operator would then say, no, uh, Mr. So-and-so hadn't checked in yet. And they'd say, well, can I leave a message for him? So then the other one would then call back looking for messages. And they did this as one of their ways of uh, communicating without ever it being traced. The most important piece of information he gave was the name of another man who had helped Connor and Doherty rob banks in the past. His name was John Harris. Agents found Harris in Tucson, Arizona. Surveilling him, they saw him making and receiving calls at a certain payphone. Getting a warrant, they tapped the phone and listened in. He was talking to Connor and Doherty. We hoped through a series of wiretaps that we might be able to uh, trace the phone back to a particular area and through investigation in that area, maybe locate them. Agents learned the fugitives were calling from Chicago and were planning another robbery there. Special Agent George Spinelli of the FBI Chicago field office distributed photos of the fugitives to area hotels. One reported a guest who looked like Joseph Doherty, though that name wasn't on the register. As I looked at the register, I looked down and I did see an alias that Connor had used in the past. At that point, I thought possibly we had two top ten fugitives at this hotel. Case agent Steve Chenoweth immediately flew to Chicago, joining the other agents at the hotel. The guest who looked like Doherty appeared to have checked out. Agents watched the room Connor might be in. If he was there, they needed to confront him outside his room to avoid a standoff. 
We were very concerned that it could get violent, and uh, especially Connor, who had vowed that he would never be taken alive. We took uh, extra precautions at that point. An arrest team planned the takedown for the parking lot. Keep an eye. Okay. Sounds good. Eventually, the FBI agent spotted someone leaving the room. I think I might have something here. Come here, take, take a, a look. look. Yeah, got some activity. Can't see his face yet. It was Connor. That's him, George. That's Connor. He was That's alone. A ID. Tony, it's our guy. Take him. Take him now. Agents called for the SWAT team to make the arrest. <laughs> So he did not have an opportunity to, uh, to get away. He was grabbed immediately. Although Joe Doherty was not seen by agents, it appeared he was nearby and saw the police activity. A call came in to um, the switchboard asking what was going on. And it was a male and asking about uh, you know, the occupant maybe of a particular room and uh, no doubt in my mind, it was Doherty, and he was trying to find out what happened. Agents searched the area, but did not find Doherty. The one thing they knew was that he would commit more robberies with a new partner. This guy doesn't have any other choice. He can't do a robbery by himself. He's got to reach out for somebody else. The FBI believed he'd call on John Harris, and learned Harris had recently flown to San Francisco. Again, they spotted Harris repeatedly using a certain payphone. They ordered another phone tap. About a week later, uh, we get a phone call, and it was uh, Joe Doherty. Doherty said he was calling from St. Louis, but FBI technicians couldn't trace the call out of San Francisco. And all of a sudden, the stark realization came to us that this guy's not in, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, Doherty is, is right there in that area. Agents realized he himself was surveilling his lookout to see if he had been followed. They hoped he hadn't seen the undercover agents. Believing his lookout was in the clear, Doherty planned a meeting for the next morning there in San Francisco. Agents showed up early. Doherty arrived as promised. And at about that time, we had a whole lot of very weary FBI agents pounce on Joseph William Doherty. And so ends the, uh, the saga and so ended the chase. After a nationwide manhunt that lasted more than a year, Terry Connor and Joseph Doherty were tried for their most recent crimes. They each received two life sentences plus 139 years without parole. They are kept in separate federal prisons. Their partnership forever terminated. In the 1990s, a disguised serial bank robber terrorizes the Chicago area. Expert with weapons, aware of police procedure, and fearless, he hits hard and disappears fast. Police and the FBI realize the only way to stop him is to catch him in the act. But his desperate violence proves impossible to predict. The average bank robbery yields roughly $3,000. Yet some criminals risk everything for the take. In suburban Chicago, 
a disguised gunman began a series of robberies, growing more violent with each one. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Tracking the robbers' movements, agents discovered he wasn't alone and would do anything to avoid capture. March 5, 1990, Chicago, Illinois. $1,000. At a bank on the city's south side, employees began what they thought was a normal work day. The neighborhood was quiet until 10 a.m. That the disguised gunman threatened to kill anyone who didn't follow his orders. The tellers knew not to interfere. It was over in seconds. When they were safe, they called police. Chicago police patrol officers closest to the bank responded first. The witnesses reported that the robber was a white male, about six feet tall. But they didn't see details of his features because of his disguise. He wore gloves and carried a police scanner. The man was aggressive, handling his semi-automatic handgun with confidence. He left no fingerprints, and security cameras revealed no other immediate clues. Police canvassed the area, hoping to find other witnesses. A woman who lived near the bank reported that she thought she had seen the robber. She said that at about the time of the robbery, she saw a man who seemed to be wearing a fake beard get into a small four-door sedan. She did not get the plates, but she did give officers a description of the car. Checking every similar car in the area, they soon found one they believed was the robber's getaway vehicle abandoned a few blocks from the bank. The officer approached with caution in case someone was still inside. But it was empty, except for a paper towel covering the broken ignition. A records check revealed the car had been stolen from a mall parking lot four days earlier. Later processing produced no leads to the robber. Bank robbery is a federal offense, so police contacted the Chicago FBI. Hi, this is Keith. Supervisory senior resident agent Bill Keefe had handled dozens of bank robbery calls. At that time, we were extremely busy with bank robberies. We had had two on one day. We were running sometimes as many as three robberies a week. Most were committed by amateurs who went in without a plan and were caught quickly. But when the bank robbery squad reviewed the reports on the South Side robbery, they noted how clean the assault was, obviously well planned. They believed it was not the bearded assailant's first robbery and would not be his last. Two months later, the robber with the fake beard hit a bank in the suburb of Libertyville. Not satisfied with cash drawers this time, he ordered a teller to open the vault. Don't you try anything. Come on, let's go. He said his police scanner would let him know if anyone hit the silent alarm. Put 
Put it in there. One. The robber escaped with thousands of dollars in cash. But this time, a teller got the license plate number from his getaway car. While Libertyville police looked for the car, Chicago FBI agents interviewed the tellers. Special Agent Hank Schmidt learned the gunman was more aggressive this time. He controlled people with the weapon. Uh, he would intimidate them by putting the gun up towards their face. He pointed the gun directly at someone when he talked to them, uh, which was intimidating to the, the tellers and the customers. Although interviews yielded no clues, police did find the getaway car, abandoned a few blocks from the bank. Again, the vehicle had been stolen from a mall three days earlier. And as before, the thief used a towel to hide the broken ignition. FBI Special Agent Dave Childry was part of the robbery squad. The squad uncovered an earlier robbery in Wilmette, Illinois, believed to be committed by the same man. One surveillance camera photo provided a frightening clue. There was a very good picture of the robber taken in which he was using what we call a weaver stance. This is a shooting position taught to police officers. It was taught to FBI agents. And if you have been taught to shoot like that, you recognize it. This person might have had some law enforcement training. If so, he would know how these investigations work, and he could prove very difficult to catch. The local press dubbed him the Bearded Bandit. Investigators took advantage of the coverage to ask citizens for help. They published enhanced stills from the robberies, hoping someone would recognize him despite the disguise. We put his picture on the news. He did wear a beard, a fake beard, and a mustache, uh, and a ball cap. So after running those pictures, we were not getting any tips from the public. In November 1990, the elusive bandit hit a bank in Wheeling, Illinois. A teller hit the alarm before he was told not to. All available units, please respond to a 1090 at the Wheeling Bank and Trust. Over his scanner, the gunman heard the police responding. He didn't leave the bank, which would be the normal reaction of bank robbers. They're there to rob the bank. They're not there to get involved in a shootout with the police. He stayed in the bank while the police were responding and held the gun up to the cashier and counted down from 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. It seemed he knew how long he had before police responded. More evidence he might be a cop. As the robberies continued, it looked like the bandit purposely chose targets in different jurisdictions to complicate the investigation. No bank was ever hit the second time. The robberies would be on the other end of the suburban area against Lake Michigan, and then they would be out in Schaumburg or Elk Grove Village or up north in the Lake County, such as Libertyville. As he struck in new suburbs, the FBI had to coordinate with a growing number of police departments. Palatine, Illinois Police Chief John Kozel, a detective sergeant at the time, learned of the case and that the bandits' getaway cars belonged to shopping mall employees stolen at the beginning of their shifts. He would steal one of the employee cars knowing that it would not be reported stolen for approximately eight hours, so he knew he had eight hours to get the vehicle to where he needed to put it before anyone would even discover it missing and it would become hot on the system. When dumping the cars, the robber did his best to interfere with the ongoing investigation, wiping them clean of fingerprints and leaving no trace of himself behind.
it was very apparent that he was aware of evidence gathering techniques of police methods. In the end, agents found nothing of evidentiary value in any of the cars. Since the cars didn't help identify the bandit, investigators followed every conceivable lead that might. They visited theatrical shops around the city, hoping a salesperson might recognize the man with the fake beard as a customer. Again, nothing. The bearded bandit committed seven armed bank robberies in the Chicago area between January 1990 and February 1991. Then the robberies stopped. We went over what we had done to that point in time, looked for things we might have missed. Maybe he'd been incarcerated somewhere. Maybe he'd moved out of state. Maybe he was dead. We just didn't know. The bandit's trail stayed cold for nine months. On November 4th, 1991, Palatine police officer Kevin Maher was working the day shift. A dispatcher in training rode along to learn procedure. I was heading southbound on Quinton Road when I saw a vehicle heading northbound. And I looked in my side view mirror and I thought what I saw was an expired tag. So I made a U-turn and I was telling my ride along that we were going to go up and see if this vehicle had expired plates. And if it did, I would conduct a traffic stop and show him how we conduct a traffic stop and how we punch all the numbers into the computer. It was supposed to be a routine stop. The person driving the vehicle swerved over to the side of the road and jammed on the brakes. He's got a gun. Maher's first instinct was to protect his passenger. The bearded bandit was back. In November 1991, a routine Chicago area traffic stop erupted in violence a when a man shot Palatine police officer Kevin Maher. I was in a state of shock because it was broad daylight, it was 11 o'clock, and it was a quiet residential street, and it was a basic ambush. And after he fired the first round, the first round came through the windshield and struck me in the shoulder, and glass from the windshield struck me in the left ear. The officer down call went out on the Illinois State Police emergency radio network. From more than a dozen surrounding suburbs, police and emergency personnel rushed to the scene. Maher realized one of the shots that pierced his windshield was aimed dead center and might have hit him in the head had he not moved to protect his passenger and reversed the car. While paramedics treated Maher, officers questioned him. As a police officer, he was a perfect witness. Trained in recalling details, he gave them a description of the gunman, the car's license plates, the type of gun, and the direction in which the attacker escaped. We got a male white, uh, six foot, 200 pounds, beard, hat, last scene going south from the scene. So let's spread out, start looking for the car, which way you want to go? Police fanned out to find the shooter. Do we know, uh, the exact direction of travel? 
More than 100 officers joined the search. Three blocks from the location of the attack, police found the shooter's vehicle. It had been reported stolen from a mall parking lot five days earlier. Palatine Police Chief John Kozel realized the grave danger. When someone is willing to shoot at a police officer um, on a routine traffic stop, we all realize that he, he's willing to shoot at anyone. His determination to escape is much greater than his concern for the safety of anyone. That would be a law enforcement officer, a citizen on the street. Uh, when you're willing to shoot a policeman, you're willing to shoot anyone. Kozel helped coordinate the search for the deadly gunman. We immediately set up a perimeter with the assistance of the state, county, and local officers in the area. We had canines on the scene. Uh, we had a chopper in the air. Uh, we notified the schools in the area to stay locked down. Evidence technicians began to process the car. The ignition was broken, the damage covered by a paper towel. They looked for fingerprints that might help them identify the perpetrator, but found none. Canine handlers brought in their dogs, which are trained to remember a scent from a specified place, then follow only that scent, ignoring others. But the trail ended not far from the vehicle. Despite the massive effort, the suspect somehow slipped away. In addition to taking it personal when one of our officers is shot, uh, we all know that a citizen is much more likely to be injured or killed, and uh, we work that much harder to uh, bring him to justice. For more resources, they called in the FBI and Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keefe. I was asked to come over to the Palatine Police Department by the Chief of Police there had been a composite sketch drawn and everybody was reviewing the circumstances of the shooting. For nearly two years, Keefe and his squad had been working the bearded bandit case. I had asked uh, if we could look at the car that was found and when I looked at the ignition, this was our bank robber. After being treated, Officer Maher came to the station to look at surveillance photos of the bearded bandit. He said the bank robber did look like the man who shot him. We surmised that he was on his way to do a bank robbery. He knew once the officer ran the plate, the car would come back stolen. He also knew that with the guns he had in his vehicle, it's not something he could conceal if the officer walked up to the vehicle. The bearded bandit had made a huge leap in violence. This guy wasn't going to go away. We were going to have to come up with a very innovative way to either identify him and charge him, or that we were going to have to catch him in the act. Chief Kozel brought the many investigators together. After the initial search, uh, uh, we set up a uh, multi-jurisdictional task force here at our police department. We had uh, the FBI, the uh, state police, Cook County Sheriff's Police, and all the local agencies uh, from our area and those involved in the fear of bank robber series. Since their suspects seemed to know police procedure, they adjusted it. 
and we learned we had a, a violent bank robber that was using a scanner. We were no longer giving out the location of the bank over the air. We were giving out a code number for each particular uh, bank. In progress. Go ahead and give us code the task three. force hoped patrol officers in the area yeah, so could well, use the codes to respond to robbery calls without the bandit banks. realizing it. Especially you undercover agents. Confident that the bearded bandit would resume his crime spree eventually, police began doing spot checks of banks throughout the region. On November 18th, two weeks after the shooting, Elk Grove Village, Illinois police officers saw nothing suspicious at one bank on their list. But later that morning, a woman leaving a nearby business did. Two people in obvious disguises entering the bank. Two weeks after a police shooting in the Chicago area that was linked to the bearded bandit, the gunman reappeared in Elk Grove Village, Illinois, this time with an accomplice. 911, can I help you? While a witness outside the bank called police, there's something very strange going on here. Okay, thank you. The robbers struck. Sit down over there. The bandit demanded money from the vault, his accomplice standing guard. 911 dispatch, aware of the bearded bandit, used a prearranged code to alert officers. 2130, 2132, code green. Without revealing information over the police scanner. They also alerted the FBI. Special Agent Hank Schmidt realized the new danger. The big concern is that the robber, in some cases, discharges the weapon when he's using it to gesture at the employees. So the potential for violence is always there. The numbers obviously increase if we have two people that are armed. In the bank, the manager explained they could not get into the time delay vault. The dispatcher instructed the witness outside to leave in case there was gunplay. Move it. With the money from the cash drawers, the robbers fled. Unaware the police had been called, the teller hit the alarm. Elk Grove Village officers approached with their sirens off, quietly surrounding the bank. If the robbers were still inside and heard police, they might take hostages. Officers were in even more danger, according to Palatine Chief John Kozel. For the first time, we had two bearded individuals rob a bank. That, of course, increased our sense of urgency even more. Now we had two armed gunmen to deal with uh, when law enforcement arrives at these banks. 2600, can you uh, call the bank, uh, find out? Through the dispatcher, police talked with bank employees. The manager said the robbers had left. The officers had to be sure. The robbers could be holding a gun on the manager, forcing her to lie. The dispatcher asked them to send one employee outside to talk to police. The manager gave them the description of the woman chosen to go. Twenty six hundred head the official come out. Okay, I see her coming out. Hi, are you aware there was a bank alarm here? Yes. Is there anybody hurt inside? No. The employee assured them the assailants were gone and no one was injured inside. All right, guys, the bank is clear, go on inside. The officers moved in to clear the bank for certain. One of the witnesses uh, told us that. She believed that the second person, a smaller person, uh, was possibly a woman disguised as a man. After the Elk Grove Village robbery, police recovered two cars with the bandit's signature ignition covering. It was more evidence of his criminal sophistication.
to cleanse himself after leaving the bank. He would drop the one off a, a block from the bank uh, that he had just gotten into that all the witnesses had seen him uh, leave the bank in, and he would uh, go a few blocks away and get into the other vehicle that he had left there previous and then since cleanse himself from that first hot vehicle. All of the cars were similar, according to Special Agent Dave Childry. We were able to kind of key in the cars by the type, the make, the size, the non-visibility of them. They were just everyday cars. He was stealing them, then letting them sit for several days before using them as getaway cars. The task force asked to be notified of similar cars stolen from area shopping malls. We were successful in getting information on cars of that type that were stolen in the northwest suburbs and in the city of Chicago. We would put that information out on a weekly basis. Agent Scott Backen from the FBI and Sergeant Steve Peterson from Chicago PD actually went to every roll call of approximately 50 to 60 law enforcement agencies and spoke to the individual officers on the need to find these cars. Those personal visits mean a lot more than just putting something out on a teletype. Somewhere in the metro area, they hoped to find a getaway car after the bandit stole it, but before he used it in a robbery. Weeks later, Officer Tom Polinski was checking an apartment building parking lot in Niles, Illinois, when he spotted a stolen car on their list. It did look like the bearded bandits' work. The agreement was if they found one of those and it did turn out to be stolen when they ran the uh, license plate that they would back off and notify us. Uh, that happened. Uh, we set up a surveillance on that vehicle. FBI agents and Niles police officers and detectives watched from an empty apartment overlooking the stolen car 24 hours a day. On December 13th, we found out that the Rolling Meadows police had located another stolen car that was in all probability one of the bearded bandits' cars. Chief Kozel was sure they were right. These two particular vehicles were both stolen out of uh, large mall areas. Both were owned by employees of those malls. Um, the MO was perfect. They set up surveillance on the second car in Rolling Meadows, too. Rolling Meadows PD stepped up. They shared uh, time, detectives, intelligence, sat with our agents out there 24 hours a day. To further ensure the bandit did not slip away, the FBI wanted to install tracking devices in the vehicles. But they couldn't do so in the parking lots. Late one night, agents removed the two cars. and replaced them with look-alikes for a few hours. It was a risky move. The thief could return at any time and spot the agents or the decoy cars. At the FBI garage, technicians installed the remote tracking devices in each vehicle. They also equipped the cars with remote kill switches that would allow agents to shut down the engines from a distance. They put the cars back and waited. Days passed. There was a nagging doubt in, in all of our minds that maybe we had been discovered, that perhaps he had seen one of us or a police officer going in and out of this apartment they were using to watch the car in Niles that he had seen somebody near the car in Rolling Meadows and that he was just going to back off these cars and never come back. We weren't sure. We just didn't know, but we, we were committed to watching these cars until something told us otherwise. 
After a week, the vigil paid off. A van pulled up, and a man approached one of the cars. This was, in my mind, a do or die effort. This is, this is going to be our only shot. If we miss this, he's gonna know where I'm going. They hoped they could peacefully end the bandit's crime spree, but no one had forgotten the last time the gunman was cornered. In 1991, as Chicago area investigators watched two stolen cars they believed were going to be used in the bearded bandit's next holdup, a man entered one of the cars. Special Agent Hank Schmidt believed it was their suspect. Uh, he matched the general physical description of the, uh, the person we were looking for as the uh, bearded robber. We have a man, we have a man. The man had been dropped off at the vehicle by someone driving a van. Minivan, mini wagon, in a white van. Heading southbound down the alley. When he drove away, the van followed. Investigators could not identify either driver. They had to be careful. If the bearded bandit and his accomplice spotted a tail, they might start shooting. But FBI technicians had installed a tracking device in the car, allowing agents to follow at a distance. The suspect parked the stolen car near a suburban bank. Any wagon is parking. The man is behind him. Hearing the news, Supervisory Special Agent Bill Keefe believed they finally found their target. When that vehicle showed up in the vicinity of a bank, our adrenaline really was pumped up, and we really knew that we were going to have it. This car was likely the first getaway car for the next day's robbery. Agents believe the two suspects would next pick up the second stolen car in Rolling Meadows. They were right. That vehicle was also equipped with a tracking device. Surveillance agents followed that car, believed to be a secondary getaway car, to a hardware store about 20 miles from the bank where the pair left it. suspects in the van, agents no longer had the benefit of a tracking device and had to stay close. They followed the van into Hanover Park, Illinois, and watched as it pulled up to a townhouse. Now, Special Agent Dave Childry could identify the people inside. We had a license plate and two vague descriptions of people, a man and a woman. Normal record checks on that license plate would tell us that that van belonged to Jeffrey and Jill Erickson. The FBI and police worked through the night to learn more. We had done uh, a lot of research, calling police departments, trying to see who these people were. We were looking for a, a previous arrest record, uh, which we didn't find. During this process, we had received some information that Jeffrey Erickson had been a police officer. In 1986, Jeffrey Erickson worked as a patrol officer in a Chicago suburb. He distinguished himself as a skilled marksman, but he was uninterested in the everyday requirements of the job, traffic stops, paperwork. He was about to be fired when he resigned. 
Records also showed that Jeffrey Erickson opened a used bookstore in early 1991, during the time the bearded bandit was on hiatus. It appeared he and his wife, Jill, a university chemistry student, led a double life, using bank robbery money to build a middle-class existence. He might not have seemed threatening on the surface, but Special Agent Schmidt knew he was. Because he's a trained individual, he knows how we're going to react. He can plan ahead for that, and uh, if he's trained with a weapon, he's going to be more professional in the way he handles that weapon, and he's going to uh, be a, a bigger threat to us. Investigators considered waiting until the Ericsons approached a bank the next day, but decided not to risk a shootout near employees and customers. We had enough that we did not have to get him in the vicinity of a bank. The safest approach would be when he came to the car, the stolen car, we would arrest him. While surveillance units watched the suspect's home, a SWAT team set up near the car in the hardware store parking lot. Police Chief John Kozel. The SWAT team set up on the, uh, the vehicles were very well aware of his background and uh, knew that he may shoot first, and they were taking that into account. By the morning, they were ready for the Ericsons to make their move. About mid-morning, the surveillance uh, units advised us that the van was, in fact, moving from the residence with uh, at least two people. They were heading in the direction of where we were watching the, uh, the stolen car. The surveillance team advised us that Mr. Erickson had got out of the vehicle in an adjoining parking lot. Yeah, the driver's in the van still. He's, he's walking uh, west. The FBI had installed a kill switch in the stolen car, which they could use to turn off the engine from a distance. Uh, we watched him uh, come around the corner from that other parking lot, go to the vehicle, and enter the vehicle and start that vehicle. Erickson was distracted by the car trouble. Okay, let's go in. The SWAT team moved in. Get back out of the car! Out of the car! Put your hands where I can see Get back out of that bag! Out of the car, put your hands where I can see them. I know that the pressure uh, of to car. shoot or not shoot is a split-second decision. Get, get your hands up. back in there, get out of the car. Most law enforcement officers don't want to have to shoot an individual if they don't have to. No one wants to take a life that way. Uh, we felt like we controlled him. Out of the car! Slowly! After twice reaching for his bag, Erickson finally followed orders. If he'd come out of the bag with a gun, it would have been an entirely different situation. I asked him as we were transporting him after the arrest to the federal lockup, you being a former police officer, you would know that a gesture like that could get you shot. And he looked at me and he said, well, I figured you'd shoot me in the head and it would be over with quickly. In the car, agents searched Erickson's bag and found the bearded bandit's tools, loaded guns, a police scanner, gloves, a beard and a wig. His bank robbery kit in that bag, it was very helpful to the case. Uh, without that information or that evidence, we just arrested a car thief. Having Jeffrey Erickson safely in custody was only half the job. In the adjoining parking lot, the SWAT team approached the van. It might be Jill Erickson inside.
agents scrambled to follow. The chase barreled through 11 suburban jurisdictions, reaching speeds of 110 miles per hour. A roadblock didn't work. And she had fired multiple rounds uh, out of that van, uh, either at the pursuing agents or other people in traffic. Uh, it was a big concern for the agents that she might hit an innocent civilian. Agents shot out the rear tires of the van. But the driver was not giving up. In 1991, a suspected bank robber led police and FBI agents on a dangerous chase through the Chicago suburbs. The fleeing van turned into an area that investigators knew had no outlet. They blocked the road. As the van charged them, they had to fire. They saw movement inside. Then, an FBI agent cautiously approached. The driver was wounded, a single self-inflicted gunshot. It was Jill Erickson. Later that night, in the hospital, she died. Special Agent Hank Schmidt. We believed it may have been a, a pact that they had both come up with that they would not be arrested. Uh, she that day carried out her part of the pact, and that day he decided, uh, for whatever reason, he didn't. Inside the van were spent cartridge casings, blood, fibers, other ammunition, uh, other weapons. There was a rifle with several hundred rounds of ammunition. That whole neighborhood became an, an evidentiary nightmare. There were bullets uh, that Jill had fired, uh, stuck in the side of houses, in cars, on the street. The FBI obtained a federal search warrant for the Erickson's home. We found some loose cash, but what impressed me was the amount of firepower in the house. An arrest at that home would have, would have evolved into a shootout. In that home, there was a weapon everywhere that you would find a picture or a statue or a knickknack in any other home. Among the weapons found was the 223 caliber semi-automatic assault rifle used in the attack on Officer Kevin Maher. Chief John Kozel realized a shootout would have been deadly to both sides. The weapons in his home were as good as any law enforcement has as far as firepower goes. Most of the long guns he had, those that type of ammunition would zip right through an officer's bulletproof vest. Another discovery in the house spoke to the couple's mindset. One of the things that we found quite uh, ironic was the television was on and the VCR was on, and there was a Bonnie and Clyde tape in the VCR, and it was queued up to the uh, point where the uh, Bonnie and Clyde are being shot to death, 
in the movie, and it was obvious that that was something they watched before they went out and did their bank robberies. Though one robber was dead and one in custody, the violence was not yet over. Jeffrey Erickson's trial began on July 13, 1992. The evidence compiled against him was strong. In all conversations with the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, the trial was going very well. They were very uh, uh, upbeat about it, and the uh, evidence was, uh, in their mind, uh, going to be enough to convict him. But then, after court adjourned on July 20th, 1992, two deputy U.S. Marshals loaded Erickson and several jail inmates onto an elevator. Erickson was still dressed for court. The prisoners were headed for a van that would take them to the Metropolitan Correctional Center. By the time the elevator reached the parking garage, Erickson had somehow escaped his cuffs. Erickson shot U.S. Marshal Bill Frakes in the back and head, killing him. Ambushed, Frakes had not had time to draw his weapon. As the gunman ran for the street, court security officer and former Chicago police detective Harry Belwomany confronted him. Erickson shot the police veteran in the chest. But before Belwomany died, he got off four rounds, fatally wounding Erickson. The gunman was 40 feet from the crowded streets when he died. The thing is, all these resources were brought to bear on an individual. He was captured and was being tried in court. You, you think the case is over, but unfortunately, the only person that could stop this individual turned out to be a very brave, courageous policeman named Harry Bellomini, who, while dying, shot and killed Jeff Erickson. A newlywed, Bill Frakes was a promising young lawman just nine months into his career. Harry Bellwomany was a 31-year veteran. Two of his children are also Chicago police officers, carrying on his legacy. <laughs> 